Greetings, my name is Pete Ring. Um, my background is military aviation with fighters and helicopters, and I do these chats on behalf of AFA New South Wales, on behalf of Wings Magazine and our Wings Magazine channel. So, so um, today we're talking with Air Vice Marshal retired uh, John Quaife, who is now a very relaxed and informal Air Vice Marshal. <laughs> So I'd like to welcome John on board. Thanks, Peter. Good to be here. Okay. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about your spectacular rejection from a mirage and um, hear about your experience. So before we start in your rejection, um, what types did you, what are the main military, what did you specialise in, in uh, military types of aeroplanes? Um, oh, fighters. Yeah, fighters, Peter. I... Um... Uh, most of my flying was done on the classic Hornet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I uh, made my way to the classic Hornet through the Mirage. So I had, you know, um, I don't know, 750 hours or something flying Mirage with uh, 75 Squadron. Uh, did the last Mirage FCI course before I moved on to Hornets. But, yeah, a little known fact that I, you know, never used to publicise a whole lot. I actually started out as a bomber pilot, although... You, you can't really say that given the era that I was flying Canberras uh, because it was right at the end of their time when they were sort of virtually doing nothing. You might recall at the end of the Canberra service, they had trouble with fatigue and the like, and they yeah. had been doing a lot of photo survey work. Well, most of that was curtailed was like, while well, I tried to figure out the uh, engineering that was going to keep the fleet going. So I, I was literally, um, I did my conversion to type and maybe flew for a couple of months before uh, people started getting posted out of two squadron. <laughs> so <laughs> I was posted off to fighters and so then stayed with fighters for the rest of my career. What, what do you think the common dangers of fighter flying are? Just for, just for the public who haven't flown fighters or people who've done lots of flying but never been behind the pole of a fighter? Yeah, look, I... Um... You have the odd opportunity to talk to young kids, you know, and I spoke with, uh, I think it might have been a graduating class at uh, 76 that were graduating lead in fighter or stuff, and, you know, I gave a bit of thought to that. Well, I actually spoke to them about what I think are the uh, the dangers of the environment. So it's not, I mean, you know, flying fighters, what you're doing is inherently dangerous if you're at the pointy end of the sphere. Um, in, in terms of what the enemy might do to you. But in terms of simply flying, uh, you know, fast barrier now in modern aircraft design that protects you, but it still doesn't mean that the, um, like, the perils of the atmosphere are any less real. So, you know, things like uh, what can quickly go wrong uh, if your oxy pressurization system fails you, as we've actually seen uh, with the classic hornets, um, that can kill you just as surely as it could, you know, in 1918. Um, so I think it's you know, my answer to your question. My first answer to your question would be that just the, the straight perils of the environment in which um, uh, the single engine, uh, single cockpit uh, fighter pilot operates. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's the sort of thing I believe in too. Um, so when you, when the, your, when the sortie that you were on when you ejected, where were you flying out of? Uh, it was, it was out of Darwin. It was a, um, uh, essentially it was a training mission for, uh, a four aircraft strike profile. So four of the squadron's mirages had planned a, um, uh, a, probably it would have been a high, low, uh, navigation route to attack a notional target somewhere out Arnhem Land, so to the east of Darwin, um, and then a, uh, a climb to height return to Darwin. And, and necessarily what they had uh, uh, sort of designed was a, a fairly circular route that took them out from Darwin back into Darwin. Um, uh, my job, I was assigned the best job ever. I, I was leading a pair of mirages that were assigned to bounce them and provide uh, enemy enemy contacts for them to encounter as they uh, went through the uh, the mission. And so um, 
um, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this, but Condo tells me just recently it was him on my wing. So myself and Pete Condon were out there screaming around at low altitude, uh, trying to highlight the uh, the four aircraft that we knew were on this route somewhere uh, to give them, you know, tap them, uh, let the, let let the sort of uh, lessons be learned about lookout and uh, and and first moves and the like. Uh, then let them go on their way, and then we'd go somewhere else and tap them again and tap them and them again. So. We were the first to run out of fuel. That made sense. Uh, and we were we were coming into the circuit, followed by the four ship that were not too far behind us, also recovering into Darwin. So I was essentially the first aircraft uh, leading an evolution of six aircraft to land at Darwin. All right, the Mirage in its ejection seat. What 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 are the capabilities of the seat you were sitting in? What uh, what are the ejection? What's the ejection envelope? The minimum safe ejection is, is altitudes that we used to talk about were if you were under control, I think it was 5,000 feet and 10,000 feet if you were out of control. So you see what's happened there is, you know, a significant buffer has been built in uh, to give you a bit of fat for mum and the kids, uh, dependent on your circumstances. So... Um, uh, you know, my circumstances, I, I was in the circuit where I had a fairly significant rate of descent, so 090 was never going to work for me. <laughs> how was how the seat activated? <laughs> um, you had two choices. You had a seat pan handle, which was the recommended technique, um, or you had a face blind handle. So which one did you choose? I chose the seat pan because it was literally the recommended technique. So the concern with the face blind handle uh, was um, that if that the the the, the very uh, nature of the motion that you actually had to go through to pull that face blind down. In fact, I might have even just done it then. Yeah, you, know, you tended to uh, move your head forward, which was the last thing you needed to do. You really needed your head, uh, you know, back on the head box of the seat. You remember to put your chin in, and if you did that, theoretically, you know, your spine was going to be close to uh, the correct posture, so you'd avoid injuring yourself. Um, so you see, if you weren't using the face blind, you could use the seat pan handle and concentrate on your posture. And, you know, the deal would be uh, grab the uh, handle firmly with one hand and your wrist with the other and then firmly pull. And so that's what I went for. Well, obviously it worked for you. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. It did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the seat <clears throat> the seat you sit in is in all ways part of the aeroplane. Like the seat... And on every day mission, sort of welded to the aeroplane in some way that, that you might be in, strapped in, fly, come back, unstrap, get out. Yeah. What what actually, just very briefly in, in broad steps, what actually happens when you pull the handle? Um, <clears throat> I hinted at this. So the, the, the very first thing that would occur is um, the uh, explosive charges would release the canopy. So yeah. the canopy would would immediately be released from the airframe, um, and the uh, the relative airflow would you know make that just clear the airframe and get out of your way. There was a um, uh, said to be a one second. The flight manual referred to a one second delay between the canopy going and the seat firing. And then what the the seat would give you is. Um, uh, a series of three cartridges that were in like a shotgun arrangement in the centre of the seat. So you get three cartridges that would fire in rapid succession that would uh, start your movement up the rails. Uh, and then the seat that I was riding had a rocket motor uh, 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 installed. Basically, under, yeah, under you're sitting on your dinghy, you're sitting on your survival pack, and underneath that was the rocket motor. Um, and, you know, so ba basically that would fire and give you um, the significant separation that would allow you, you know, theoretically to even eject on the ground. Um, and then uh, all of that time, you're sitting strapped to the seat just like you are when you first strap in. Uh, and it's not until the rocket motor has fired that then uh, the seat decides based on um, your barometric altitude whether you can be separated from the seat or not. And that's that's to allow you to have a much longer ride in the seat if you're at high altitude. But if you're at low altitude, it'll go, okay, you can have your parachute straight away. Um, so it releases a, a small drogue parachute that it in turn 
uh, that stabilizes the seat, but that in turn then will extract the main parachute um, that's, that's basically your parachute that you're going to end up uh, riding. Uh, and, and that that action separates you from the seat because at the same time uh, that that's occurring, a charge has gone around the seat and cut your straps. So, so punk, suddenly you're, um, you're now a parachutist where a minute ago you were a fighter pilot. Um, <laughs> And that's that. That's basically that. Except that, um, again, pertinent for my circumstance, or everyone's, I guess. But you mentioned it. The um, the thing you're sitting on comes with you for the ride. So the thing you're sitting on is um, or was a um, uh, like a green coloured fiberglass box underneath uh, a little bit of uh, sort of padded stuff, which is basically the parachute harness. And that that box has got your dinghy. Uh, and survival pack in it that's coming with you because you're going to need that. So that stays with you, uh, but it stays, you know, when you imagine in the parachute, the seat's now gone, but that that box is sort of hanging around somewhere near your bum. And um, the, uh, the methodology for getting your dinghy to inflate uh, involved um, dropping that pack uh, by little clip fastener things that, that sort of uh, fitting that would be at the top of your bum uh, you could reach around find the fasteners activate the clips and the uh, the box would fall and end up on you know 15 meters of lanyard that's actually uh, also uh, plugged into you when you're strapped into the jet and the action of that would inflate the uh, dinghy none of that's got any relevance to me except that um, there had been a uh, Mirage ejection. Uh, Jim Barden and JP Conlon had ejected out of a, um, a two-seat Mirage down the other end of the airfield, not that not that long before myself. And uh, Jim had hurt his back uh, in a, in a sort of awkward landing because he hadn't managed to get rid of the seat pan, the seat pack, right? And so when he landed, you can imagine that's behind his knees almost, you know, and so it got in the way of his elegant arrival back on terra firma. And I was aware of that. Oh, shit. Um, so uh, when I found myself in the parachute um, to sort of inter interject with, with stories of the ejection, the first thing I did was see the aircraft flying away. Uh, and I uh, fantastic, check that out, <laughs> thinking that I was going to see it land, right? But then the next thought that popped in my head was, shit, better get rid of the parachute pack or you know, the uh, dinghy pack, right? So I go looking for the, the fasteners, but again, just like I did then, that, that caused me to look down and the ground was, Im was imminent. And so I didn't actually find the clips, didn't release the dinghy pack, and I landed. So it was all pretty quick. So what, what circumstances might be discussed in your pre-flight briefings regarding ejection? What, which, which sorts of things oh, would there be? Not, not so much pre-flight briefing, but um, certainly um, <clears throat> we. You know, they, I don't know whether they still do. I guess they do. But, you know, you'd remember back in the good old I certainly, buddy, it was the, the curse of the flying training schools was morning quiz. Where you know it's <laughs> the old FTS technique of everyone standing up until they you know basically if they get an answer right they can sit down but the idiots are left standing very uh, very powerful reinforcement to actually learn your checks um, but yeah so uh, the fighter squadrons were in the habit then of, of replicating that possibly still do uh, with a morning quiz including you know an emergency of the day to discuss and but you know rather than um, you know the very uh, rote learning of checklists. The uh, the the operational squadrons would tend to um, uh, you know sort of uh, lay problems out that you could then discuss, and you get the opinions of the more senior guys. And it was a very healthy way of sharing the knowledge. And so, I, I, one of the um, scenarios that certainly was discussed was, you know, what are you going to do if you if you have uh, an engine problem in 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 this circumstance or that circumstance, and certainly an injection uh, an engine problem in the circuit was a topic of discussion. And so um, the the beauty of that was 
that the understanding of the pros and cons and the discussion of all that, you know, had been pre-done. Uh, so that when I was faced with that emergency, I, I'd already had somewhere in the back of my filing system, you know, somewhere there was a card that said, this is what you got to do. Uh, so I knew that there was um, uh, really no alternative other than an ejection given the circumstance I found myself. So uh, I spoke about talking to young kids. I, I did that. Uh, at Tamworth a couple of times where I was speaking to kids that were in the basic flying training school and I, what I wanted to do was two things. One, stand in front of them and say, see, you can ride an ejection seat and you can still walk around and look basically human. Um, but the second was I really wanted to reinforce uh, the logic behind the, the morning quiz and the learning checks and the importance of that uh, because I, I fundamentally believe that saved my life. And so, um, you know, giving kids, you know, you can tell kids they have to do things, but if you can explain to them why, it's so much more powerful. But, sure is, yeah. yeah. You, were, you were pitching into the circuit, you said earlier, getting sort of almost imminently landing, and that's when you first noticed your problem. Uh, yeah, kind of, not quite. So, um it was a very much an, a visual approach to uh, the circuit. So through initial uh, pitch into circuit on downwind, downwind checks, or perform normally. So the uh, the jet was, uh, I got to the base turn point, everything was hunky-dory normal, um, you know, including, <laughs> including, you know, three greens and wheels and all that sort of stuff. I might mention that the aircraft was configured with um, uh, a centerline tank, and two supersonic tanks. So big tank on the center line, two supersonic tanks. Um, then base turn point. Um, I, 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 for some reason, this here I am talking to you, but for some reason this ejection's become topical uh, on bloody social media and stuff just recently. And I, I got a note from um, Dave Halloran, uh, who was talking about a technique that he used to use flying the uh, base turn. And if Dave's ever watching this, I can confirm his suspicions are correct. I, I was using the two OCU technique, which was essentially um, uh, to basically pull the throttle back as you entered the base turn. And as the angle of attack uh, would rise on the aircraft, so the angle of incidence, uh, which would indicating by uh, the green amber and red lights up at, and basically what you were looking for was to have amber red uh so um you know a f fairly high angle of attack in that base turn uh which which also meant a fairly high amount of induced drag so as that drag was building on the aircraft what had previously been um a, a low power setting became quite a high power setting so the action was you know to have um uh uh, a, a slight retardation of the throttle as you rolled into the turn and then as you're about a quarter of the way into turn the throttle was coming up to hold that amber red incidence as you continued around the base turn uh the problem for me uh manifested as i was pushing the throttle up um so there was no there's no bang as i've heard other people uh, tell me i i heard no no there wasn't it, it the engine just uh you know basically farted it was and, and it was a continual fart so basically i'm getting a mm -hmm. uh, instead of a, you know a healthy roar out, out of the atar so it was clear that i'd had something dramatic happen to the engine um it, and in fact i figured i just figured it was a compressor stall not that i had a lot of experience of that but definitely i had had some sort of an engine failure and so now i was in Basically, uh, courtesy of that morning quiz discipline, uh, I was now, uh, you know, quickly bypass troubleshooting mode and straight into ejection mode. So from there, yeah, I basically, yeah. uh, it was, um, I, I rolled the wings level because um, having the ejection seat pointed towards the sky is much better than having it pointed in any other direction. So I rolled the wings level. Um, and as I was doing that, I'd made a radio call, uh, which I am told sounded very professional and cool, calm and collected, which I'm really pleased about, but I'd really no recollection of that at the time. Um, rolled the wings level and uh, essentially initiated ejection. Um, 
Uh, other people have speculated that I had, uh, in, you know, pointed the aircraft away from built-up areas, you know, the uh, kiddies kindergarten scenario, um, which is, I'll take that too, but I think that's an exaggeration. Um, it was, it was frankly, um, not really a consideration for me because all I was looking at was mud flats, so there was nothing there. So it was not a consideration for me. Fortunately, and so the hypothetical of what would I have done if I was actually pointed at the North Cliff, North Cliff Buddy Kindergarten is, I don't know, I don't know, because that was not the situation. Um, so anyway, roll the wings level, point at the mud flats and eject. Uh, as, as I said, I ejected with uh, the seat pan handle, I pulled the seat pan handle, and um, the canopy went straight away. More than anything else, I was really concentrating on posture. Right, so I'm sitting back, head down, um, and uh, the canopy's gone, and I'm I'm waiting for the big bang. Right, uh, the big bang didn't occur. Now, the Mirage used to have a simulator, and it was fairly basic. And one of the things that they used to do to you in the simulator was uh, uh, they used to use it for emergency procedures and the like, and in particular in the run up to your first solo, and the the final sim that you did before your first solo was a scenario that took you to an ejection decision. And all the guys on my course were regarded by the instructors as being all fairly pathetic because none of us could get the ejection seat handle to actually activate the little green light that said successful ejection in the sim um, until, you know, I guess it must have been instructors comparing notes about what a bunch of pussies we were, that they realised that, hang on, this, this doesn't ring true. You know, maybe there's something going on here. So they looked at it a bit closely and they realised that there was binding in the uh, seat mechanism that was causing the seat pan handle uh, to, you know, to be difficult to activate the sears in the seat, right? And so we were forgiven for being a bit on the soft side. And then someone had the, the scathingly brilliant thought, Oh, I wonder if that's in the actual aircraft as well. And and so they looked and they said, yep, yeah, sure as shit, it was. And so there was an STI went through the fleet uh, and um, that that sort of, uh, I'm not sure what was causing the problem, but the problem was fixed, right? And so this was in the back of my mind that there, you know, that the seat pan handle had proven problematic in the past, right? So I'm being quite critical in my, my judgment of the one second delay that I'm supposed to get. And uh, I, I don't think I, I, I don't think, well, I know I got, in my mind, I got longer than a second, but suffice to say, it was long enough for me to, holy shit, give it another healthy tug to see if I couldn't get that bloody sear to, you know, to release. Still nothing. And just as I was looking down to go, what the hell's going on? Uh -huh. and Oh. Um, and so I was now in the situation where, you know, having been a, a very, you know, disciplined young fighter pilot, you know, with my posture and head and all that sort of shit, now suddenly I wasn't. And so my ride up the rails initially was me straining to get my head back on the headrest. Oh. Um, I, I'm not sure I did. It kind of felt, I felt like one of those cartoon characters, you know, the eyeballs do <laughs> sort of thing. Just uh, the, um, the, the ride on, I was sort of conscious of the, the ride on the cartridges, but it's, and this, you got to realize that this is very rapid. So bang, bang, bang. And, and now, now it's all rocket motor. Um, but when the rocket motor fired, I lost vision. And so I um, think that's straight, uh, you know, acceleration versus eyeballs. Uh, physiologically, I was never going to be able to stay. My eyeballs were never going to be able to keep up with that. And I lost vision. Uh, and because I lost vision, I was also now subjected to, you know, the fluids of the inner ear. And to me, it felt like I was tumbling forwards. Uh, I lost, lost real vision but I had like uh, almost, it was blackness, but punctuated by fireworks type things going, going on in my vision. Very weird uh, and very disorienting. Um, not particularly scary because it was sort of all happening so quick, you know, it was just like a, uh, I don't know, like the proverbial fairground ride, I guess. And then also very quickly, 
uh, I was suddenly zapped back to reality. Bang! Suddenly everything came back to normal and I could see. Uh, and what I saw was <laughs> the jet flying away. So that that bang back to reality was the shoot opening uh, wow. following seat separation. Um, and like I said, saw the aircraft flying away. Great. I'm going to see that bloody thing land. Look down, ah, ground and land. So I, I probably got, uh, you know, if I got a swing in the shoot, I was probably lucky. It was it was pretty, pretty uh, wham bam. Thank you, man. So just before you go any further, did you did, did was there any in, investigation as to whether the seat actually had delayed, or they couldn't determine anything like that? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. I've had a lot of people say to me, "Oh, yeah, JQ, it was." It's just, uh, you know, then everyone says that's time compression, all that sort of stuff. I, I, I don't have, I, I actually went looking, and I don't have anything to back this up, but I have a recollection of, and I, I can't even remember, Roger Wilson was the president of the Board of Inquiry. I can't remember yeah. who the uh, engineers were, yeah. um, but I, I do have a recollection that um, they did do some, like, analysis of, what the timeline would have been, but you know it's pretty hard to do that sort of stuff very accurately. Um, and the, and the, and then I have a uh, yeah a vague um, you know idea that was what was put to me was something along the lines of yeah we looked at it and even though the flight manual quite bearing in mind it's the pilot's flight manual it's not how to build a mirage um the pilot's flight manual quite clearly said it's a one second delay but in effect how that one second was generated uh meant you could get anything yeah a little bit variable so it could have been i don't know anything say from you know 0.6 of a second to two seconds or whatever and that would still be regarded as serviceable uh -huh. i'm making those numbers up i don't know but I do have a recollection that that sort of information was fed back to me. So maybe I did get longer than my one second. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it makes no difference to me. But that, what it does do is explain the fact that I was starting to look down. Uh, yeah, when, so, so then, Lindsay Boyd, who he ejected in 1974, what, what year did you eject? Um, 85. Okay. Well, Lindsay Boyd pulled the handle with his left hand. Yeah. And nothing, nothing happened. Nothing at all. So he, he sat there a bit like you, a bit bewildered, and go, no, it's supposed to be quicker than this. Yep. He actually then looked down, put his right hand on, because he pulled it with his left hand, put his right hand on the uh, handle and pulled again, he said. And um, and then when he put, when he really gave a huge yank, it it, it, it activated. Yeah. So the, there was investigation about that very thing about whether the handle had some, um, not malfunction, but some binding or something that yeah. problem. So who would know whether your second pull activated or whether you were just um, yeah, that, that yeah. doesn't really matter. It's just an interesting thing because you got yeah. one, one swing before you hit the ground, one swing in the parachute. It's getting a bit marginal. Uh, you're frozen. Okay. <laughs> Pretty on the edges of the envelope, absolutely. Yeah, mate. Anyway, so you touched down the dinghy pack. Did that cause you any heartache? Uh, no, it didn't. I um, uh, No, it was all fairly inelegant. You know, I had in mind that I was going to do the pucker, you know, forward roll thing. <laughs> um, that, there was no such elegance to my arrival. I, I basically hit the ground like a sack of potatoes uh, and it, it very much you know, winded me, you know, knocked the stuffing out of me, actually. Um, and where where I was um, was on the mangrove mudflats off Nightcliff there off the end of the runway at Darwin, um, the western end of the runway, um, and uh, the tide was out, uh, not completely out. So when you, there are photos of the aircraft getting around where it's quite clearly just sitting on mudflat, uh, there was a little bit of water around at the time of the incident, so the tide was in the process of going out. And so I probably ended up in a, I don't know, maybe a centimetre of water, you know, pretty flat, you know, the Darwin boots, mud boots thing. And um, so I was lying there like a sack of potatoes thinking, oh, right. So, you know, I've probably broken all sorts of bones in my body here until, you know, as 
it was like you know coming back to life you know so it started twitching and I realized yeah you idiot you know get up you're not hurt um stood up and I, I was fine I guess the adrenaline's flowing but yeah I was pretty good and was able to then you know wave to the the remaining five aircraft in the landing sequence that were now circling overhead and uh you know funny story for the guys at Sarflight they had um the Channel 8, I think it was, was a local TV station, commercial TV station in Darwin. They were out uh, at Sarflight doing a story on the uh, the rescue lads. <laughs> and um, as the, uh, they're outside filming an interview with uh, the guys and um, uh, when the crash alarm went off and, you know, they, uh, they, t- they tell the story, you know, because the, uh, it was the uh, media were, or on you know on the side of the the one on one interview situation, who could see over the Sarflight guy's head, you know the mirages in the circuit, and actually saw the whole thing going on, and they thought, hey, Jesus, well, the Air, Force, <laughs> Air Force put on a pretty good show, don't they? Um, and so, yeah, needless to say, that just meant that the guys were uh, at the helicopter and ready, so they jumped straight on board, and like you know, really lickety split, they they had turned up. Uh, were able to land right beside me, given that I was on the mud flats, you know, do the old thumbs up and jump on board, and I was back at the base in very short order. What could you see in regards to your aeroplane at that stage? I didn't see it. I, so I, the last I saw of it was before it landed. So uh, when I was on the ground there, um, I couldn't see the aircraft. Um, so I, I was like at the edge of the mangrove trees, okay. Yeah. So there were, you know, if I looked that way, I could see out to the ocean. If I looked in this way, I'm looking at mango trees, and somewhere over there was the was the jet. So I couldn't see it. So are you looking for crocodiles as well? <laughs> if I'd been there any longer, I would have been. That thought didn't cross my mind, but yeah, would have. <laughs> so did they did they find out what was the cause of the engine failure? Yeah, they did pretty quickly. You know, the uh, the the process. You know, it sort of kicks into gear, and uh, Mark Pearsall was the unit flying safety officer in Perth. I, you know, I think I've marked Perth for life because he he remembers more about this incident than I do. In fact, you know, and he remembers the date it occurred and sends me an email to remind me. Oh, I'd just forget about it. You know, anyway, Perth did all the right things, and uh, and I, maybe even I don't know. He was he was. <laughs> He was a bit miffed because I was supposed to be isolated, right? So my evidence, subsequent evidence yeah. of the court of inquiry wouldn't be corrupted. He was a bit miffed when he found out that the rest of the lads from the squadron turned up and snuck in the medical with beers and stuff. <laughs> and that it appeared we were having a bit of a party that night. Um, <laughs> what else would he expect? <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, there was a you know the the, the questioning started with uh, you know write down your recollections and all that sort of stuff, and um, uh, I can't even remember whether the board of inquiry even got as far as interviewing me. They might have been set up to do so and sort of no, I'm no, I'm a flying officer, right? So I'm going to be interviewed by the wing commander. So I'm a bit nervous about yeah. this process, yeah. um, and um, all of a sudden, interest in me was lost. All of a sudden, no one wanted to talk to me. Uh, no one needed to talk to me. Uh, the investigation had gone elsewhere. And that was because the, um, I think I'm right in saying that all of this had occurred by that stage, but it was because the uh, probable cause had been found. Um, the uh, the engine and components thereof were taken down to um AMRL at Fisherman's Bend, and the engine experts down there discovered that uh, the in a uh, acceleration control unit of the engine was a device called the stops corrector, and that was uh, stuck essentially. Wow. Uh, what this thing would do, it was if you imagine a, a needle that had um, uh, like a flyweight thing, you have to imagine my fists aren't there, that, you know, that was spinning. And as as the rate of spin increased, the little flyweights would, would move in that sort of motion. And that sort of motion was controlling the movement of a pin that could tr- control the amount of fuel that was being passed uh, into the engine, which meant that um, you had protection 
uh, from compressor stall or uh, uh, an over rapid accelerator, you know, more fuel turning up into the engine than it could handle, if you like, you know, simplistic terms, getting the mixtures all wrong, um, that could induce a compressor stall. And this protection device was no longer providing protection. And when they looked at my jet, they discovered, yep, uh, the stops corrector was in a stuck position. Uh, uh, furthermore, when they looked at the fleet, they discovered a high proportion of stops correctors in the engines of the fleet were also stuck wow. uh, and wow. not providing protection. So this was one of those accidents that was wow. going to happen to somebody sooner or later. Wow. It just happened to yeah. choose you. Yep. Yeah. And have you had any lasting effects from your ejection, either emotional or physical? Um, so to the officers from Veteran Affairs that are viewing this, I'd say absolutely. I'm uh, really badly affected, but no, no, not particularly, Ringo. I do get, you know, I've got a bit of a, uh, like most people my age, I get a bit of a twingy yeah. back, yeah. Had a bit of a sore back for a while, had some horrendous bruising down there that was very colourful, but um, uh, no, no, no sort of real not, um, touch wood damaging yeah. effects. So you yeah. went on to a long career on fighters. So obviously, one Mirage ejection didn't didn't um, didn't uh, limit you from um, continuing to uh, explore the fighter on uh, the fighter world. No, I'm actually quite taken by the theory that says, you know, it, all you've got to do in the Air Force is bring your name to attention, and it doesn't really matter whether That's it's for right. a good thing or a bad thing, you know. <laughs> but just bring it to attention. Yeah, yeah we know him promoting <laughs> exactly. Um, if you're talking to a young fellow now, and you have already mentioned several times talking to young people about this, that, and the other thing, is there any general comment you'd make about, um, besides the one that you think the stand-up uh, examination of certain incidents has prepared you oh, yeah. for quick ejection? Is there anything else you'd add to that for young people who are just beginning their flying career with an ejection seat and still um, still look at the ejection seat with some awe? Um. Not really, Ringo. It's the quality of training. You know, people would, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, talk to you about, you know, this this novelty of someone who's ejected with, oh, that must have been horrendous. That must have been quite an experience or whatever. And I, I tend to uh, belittle it, belittle it a bit by saying, well, you know, the my my net reaction to all of this was a, a big smile and and it was a you couldn't get the smile off my face for ages yeah. Yeah. and the smile was about um uh the fact that i had done it and and this has to do with uh, probably again you know those sort of crew room discussions when you read about the experiences of other people in other air forces and the like, and you certainly come across plenty of instances where uh, pilots had killed themselves, essentially, uh, by not making a timely ejection decision. And um, that was the main thing that I found was, you know, so pleasing yeah. was the fact that when I was presented with the circumstances, I made a timely decision, yeah. just, yeah. Uh, and managed to save save my ass. So it was it was again sort of reflects the importance of um, being able to you know react to your training. Yeah. And uh, by the way, you know the way that the Air Force approaches this is not too bad in terms yeah. of uh, the advice that you're given and the way to react is usually you know pretty much always right. And I think uh, do you reflect much on in the sense that. The big smile was also part of the fact that you're still alive and enjoying life. And there's other people who were faced with very close to your situations who, who, who didn't, who had the gone on the wrong side of that. Um, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely could see the um, uh, the potential for being nervous about initiating ejection, yeah. interfering with your timely initiation yeah. and yeah. ejection. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you think, well, why do people stick around in the cockpit yeah. trying to yeah. problem yeah. solve? Well, yeah. often it's because, you know, something has gone wrong with the jet yeah. and the first reaction is, oh, my God, what have I done? Yeah. You know, so the first reaction is, is human reaction, is yeah. to perhaps stick around to see if I can fix what it is I have done. And in doing so, basically uh, put their yeah. life in jeopardy. Yeah, yeah it'd be a lot. As you mentioned, it's probably some sort of guilt factor that I'm going to lose this magnificent aeroplane and what sort of shit, what sort of trouble will I be in? Yep. Um, 
so I I um I think that would be a really good point for to um for young pilots to uh, get some value from talking to people such as yourself about that very fact. Yeah. Not, not a big long lecture, but just over a bit yeah. talking about that sort of thing. Exactly. So I'd like to thank you for being so candid about everything and um and obviously in enjoying your your um your your recall of your life in fighters. Um, and uh, and and at my age anyway, because you're still a young chap. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> you kind of wake up some mornings and think, mm, "What will I do today?" And you know, it's not going to be quite as exciting as it used to be. <laughs> Perhaps not. So and that's a good you. thing. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, John, and um, and uh, and it was a pleasure to to have a, have a yarn to you. Yeah, likewise, Peter. I enjoyed it. Cheers. <laughs>